So yesterday we were really focused on craft. Um, and you know, towards the end of the day, we pivoted and did the sort of 10,000 foot view look at the current cultural climate <coughs> for political climate. This morning, we are going to assess the comedic landscape together, um, uh, looking, thinking specifically about the American theater. Um, so this is an hour and a half uh, session that we have now. And we're gonna try to keep it um, roughly split between these three topics. Um, of course, we'll, we'll follow the flow of conversation and, and we'll see where you all take it. Um, but I would like to start out with um, a pretty broad question, but you know, what is the current state of comedy in the <coughs> theater? You know, who's doing comedies? Who's not doing them? Uh, what kind of comedies are being programmed? Should I bring in Ramiz again? Yeah. Should I have him kick us off? Yeah. Um, how do you assess the position of comedy in American theater and what are the challenges to the form? I think it gets shit on quite a lot. I don't think theater respects a comedy. What I mean by that is, that is what I have seen in theater is willingness to only allow comedy that is safe and tested, but anything that pushes the envelope scares administrators away, seemingly for the simple reason that it will scare the rich white donors. And ain't that a fun way to make art? I mean, I've seen a few good comedies on stage. Noise is off, bad Jews, Spider-Man, turn off the dark. <laughs> but, we all, but all those were safe bets. Well, maybe not, <laughs> maybe not Spider-Man. There was nothing safe about that show. Is this thing on? Uh, look. <laughs> uh, look, I'm speaking experientially here. Let me explain. I'm brown, Middle Eastern brown to be exact, and I write comedy, really effective comedy. I know this uh, because I've seen my stuff work in a room full of strangers, but because I'm not of a race that has been allowed to be funny beyond what I see as racial buffoonery, then me being funny doesn't get to go further than a workshop so theaters can put a check mark in their diversity folder. Mm. This may seem a bit like sour grapes, but I'd be willing to bet there are a lot of folks out there who feel the same way. So I think a theater which sees itself as a high art form, when you bring in something that is funny, but that doesn't fit an already made mold or template, the high art tends to look down on that. But then we're getting into elitism in theater and that would need a whole other podcast. <laughs> but since comedy is seen as, low, as a low art, I feel like it only gets let in the front door begrudgingly. Also, we came from fucking Puritans who thought laughter was an indulgence. <laughs> that attitude is cellular for a lot of people still. Laughter is a show of emotion, it's vulnerable, is therefore scary. So yeah, comedy has a long way to go in the theater, or actually theater has a long way to go to meet comedy in a reasonable place. It means theaters have to take risks, which is a terrifying thing for most of them to do. I'm throwing a little shade here, but I think it's needed. We need to laugh more, we need it. And challenges to the form, the only challenge I see is the challenge of being granted the platform in the first place. Theaters need to start letting different kinds of people be funny and understand that different cultures have different kinds of comedy. And if they want to cultivate audiences that will live past the next 10 years, they need to start diversifying the kinds of voices that get to speak in their spaces. That means speak dramatically as well as comedically. And that's all, that's all I said. <laughs> <coughs> and we have Sean and a baby. <laughs> Baby. Yes. <laughs> Guys, don't drive into Boston at night in the morning. <laughs> this is, I, I know you don't know this. But yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 I love Ramiz. Um, and for those of you who don't know Ramiz, he's also like ridiculously tall and very skinny and wears these fabulous glasses. So like I'm just picturing him saying all that and it's, it's, it's delightful. Where is, is he based out of New York now or LA? I think LA. I don't know. He was going to fly in from Burbank. Yeah. yeah. I never see him in either of those places. <laughs> <laughs> and just to add into what he uh, articulated in a fabulous way is uh, that <coughs> is the audience is also all white, which is uh, predominantly white at uh, most of the large institutions. <coughs> and so the, the fear that the artistic directors have of programming something is also part, like that is a huge part of it. So like even the most well-intentioned artistic directors also live in a certain amount of fear of their audience, not just the donors. Um, and we're so distracted by this baby now. Hi everybody. <laughs> <laughs> There's a baby here. Um, 
but uh, that to me that the, I think I talked about this a little bit yesterday of just the um, the that sense that uh, you only have so many slots and you want to do something important and you want to tell these stories and tragedy feels inherently more important and uh, the argument to to do comedy like I know for me and I'm looking at my dramaturg pals like we have contorted ourselves into any number of shapes trying to talk about why it's all so important, like why this play is not just silly, and you know, and trying to give something more merit than it, than the artistic director thinks it has, um, even though it's already there. If people would just read the work mm. as we are reading it, um, and so that that question is to me always at the heart of why program is why comedies don't get programmed more often. Where are we seeing comedies programmed and by whom? And by whom? Like I'm looking especially at, I mean, certainly the playwrights, but definitely folks at institutions, like where do you see them happening and what kind of comedies are getting programmed? I can speak for us. So Company One um, is a theater that sits at the intersection of art and social change. So everything we program is designed to push our audiences and our communities towards um, taking action for social justice. And as a result, we program uh, more comedies than anything else, because the comedies we program are primarily by people of color, primarily um, using comedy to, uh, like a knife, get into the middle of a social issue and um, kind of dissect it and look at it from a couple different perspectives. And so I will say that as we sit around our programming table um, throughout the year, we are most often not turned on by tragedies that are dealing with uh, social justice issues because that just feels like Jesus how are we going to get through that one um, but we are really engaged by comedies that are um, that are turning these issues inside out and upside down and trying to position the artists the company and the community towards taking an action step so I, that is not uh, that is not common across the American theater landscape necessarily but I will say for us we are always looking for comedies that are really socially engaged and that are using sort of that that, that subversive quality in order to get us looking at the world in a new way. I can say two sentences about us. I mean, like, um, <laughs> that's all I will say. <laughs> um, we, we have noticed that we tend to program a lot of gut punch comedies, mm -hmm. of like comedies that, that are funny for about the first <laughs> hour and a half and yeah. then get like super serious. Like, um, Mike Luce Tiger Style, mm -hmm. um, Lydia Diamond Smart People, Gina Gianfrido's Rapture Blister Burn, like plays that play like a comedy for a yeah, long yeah. time and then um, ultimately are like, how do I live in the world and be me? Um, uh, in, a, in a really serious way. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and often have the conversation with our audience when they come of like, is this a comedy? <laughs> I don't feel so great when it ends. <laughs> <laughs> and so like figuring out how to market that and talk about that to people um, is something that we talk about a lot. Um, um, and uh, we, don't, we don't tend to program a lot of silly and we need to figure that out. Well, it's funny, um, one of my, I, I was not super involved in the, the planning of that season, but um, they did, uh, uh, the March Brothers, they did Animal Crackers mm. at OSF, I think it was my second year there. And the audience just could not get enough of it. <laughs> and um, and then a couple of, the f two years later, th we did Coconuts with the same guys playing the Marx Brothers that had played the Marx Brothers before. Oh. And um, and it was super fun and super silly. And like in in that Marx Brothers way, like there is the the dig at you know I w you know the the upper I, w I wouldn't be part of any club that would have me as a member kind of undercurrent mm -hmm. of itself. And um, and I also realized, but this is a side note, that it was also like the least Jewish version of the Marx Brothers you've ever <laughs> seen. <laughs> but that's something else entirely. <laughs> but the audience just loved it, and so uh, that sense of trying to program comedies, you know, uh, OSF programs, you know, it's new work, Shakespeare, classics, contemporary classics, <coughs> it's sort of a big mix of, across 11 shows. And um, we were trying to bring in more uh, women writers in particular, and so I have a huge, huge soft spot for Wendy Wasserstein. 
And where Wendy Wasserstein lives right now, or her work lives right now, is somewhere between classic and dated, right? Mm -hmm. like it, it hasn't quite transcended, or not all the work has. But Sisters Rosenzweig was like, I read it again for like the first time in a long time, and I was like, we could actually totally do this one now. And so I brought it, I was bringing it to the, to the large season planning group, and I remember turning to my artistic director and I said, we're gonna read it, and everyone's gonna say, why should we do this play? It's not important. It's just about a bunch of rich white people just sitting around complaining. And then somebody is going to say, what about Man Who Came to Dinner? Mm -hmm. And sure enough, <laughs> we're like in the circle, we read the play, everyone's like, like half the group loves it, half the group is like uh, rich white people complaining. And then somebody, sure enough, is like, wait a second, what about Man Who Came to Dinner? And I just looked at Bill and I was like, because there's that problem too of just sort of figuring out how do you get beyond man who came to dinner <laughs> to open up the party to, you know, Wendy or Karen or all of you. Um, the tried, tried, true and tested thing that people want from comedy is, is hard to find. You know, my, my own sense as a playwright, and I live outside the theater community, so I probably have a little perspective, <laughs> is that plays are evaluated based on what they're about. Mm. That is, if you can justify the material by saying it's about something important, mm. whether it's a comedy or tragedy. And, I, and I've stopped reading American theater for that reason, because it seems to me that's the litmus test, is, is it about something important? And my new comedy, which Sean is doing, it's about like the worst waiter in the world. <laughs> and that's small, that's tiny. And, and so I feel, as a craftsperson, that, nothing, that the attention isn't being paid to execution. It's all about subject matter. We do uh, a lot of comedies, and, and I think one of our core values is joy. And I, that actually took a while to convince the board that that should be a core value, because there was a lot of questions of like, but we want to be, we're a real theater, we're a Lord theater, as though somehow those ideas are in opposition, <laughs> you know? And so it's like, no, once we convince them that like, you know, like joy is part of it. And, and it was so wonderful to be here yesterday and then to go and watch, we did a first preview of Murder for Two with Joe Canosian in it. And it's like, that audience was literally screaming at the end their love for the show, you know? And it's like, that show is thought of as uh, everybody does it. But there's something to be said for it. Guys, everybody does it. You know, there, <laughs> there is something in that show that is inherently universal uh, and populist in terms of, of what people respond to. And so, you know. Even though our board was nervous about joy being a core value, it's clear that on nights like last night, our audience has no second thoughts about being joyful when they come to the theater. I, mean, I think that's something that working with John and MRT has really like, bolstered in me, is that these plays that I thought were like dramas that were funny or comic dramas like, could also just be comedies, and they could still have, what, if they're gut, what Charles was going, gut punch comedy, they could still have something at the end that feels bigger than maybe the first third or two did. But if they're also sillier, like that's also really worthy. And I think that, um, I think as a, a playwright, sometimes it's hard to have confidence, confidence in that when you look at how most of the seasons look. Oh, I guess I was just thinking because we, because we do have this binary of comedy versus drama, are you? Are we arguing that there should be fewer dramas? <laughs> or like, is is that an assumption that we're <coughs> making in this conversation? And what is what does that mean? I, you know, yes. I, I, No, I, re I reject the binary. I love dramas, and yeah. I have the greatest admiration for people who can write them well. I, I think what we're asking for is a sort of parody of, of a sort of, you know, that they're treated with um, a similar respect. Because, I, yeah, I think the, maybe it's the, the binary that I see uh, maybe more tangibly is, like, what you're saying about subject matter, like shows that are, that are about an issue versus shows that are about a w or about something smaller that can't be defined politically maybe and for me I think there is actually quite a lot of comedy that's following in that's in the social justice bucket um, and it's the comedy that lives outside of that bucket is that that's what's getting overlooked to me maybe that's mm -hmm. the and there's probably drama too 
that's outside of the social justice bucket that is also getting overlooked right now. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's true. I don't know what the stats are, but it feels <laughs> like the most produced comedy in America might be like the importance of being earnest. <laughs> and it's like, oh, it's universal. It's like, is late Victorian <laughs> really a universal thing? Because I go to that and go like, I'm going to get it. I mean, it did in high school because we had to. But I don't feel like that's, that's really what's pressing like, the youth of America right now. Yeah. Um, it's public domain, though. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Follow the money. <laughs> that's what we're doing. Um, yeah, and, and, and you know, it's like it, 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 it feels like we're, um, we're talking about slots and the, the slot mentality. Um, uh, it's like we're fighting against a Christmas Carol <laughs> and the importance of being earnest every season. And um, I think that, um, uh, from my perspective, um, trying to earn a, earn a slot, you're also competing against other people within your ethnic category. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to. And, and, and you look around, and like sometimes people within the ethnic category, are like, oh, what's getting produced there? It's like, oh, it's it's about North Korea, or it's about China, or, or it's um, about how I hate my parents, which I really don't. Um, and so that feels like it's like not only am I pushing for comedy, but I'm also pushing up against um, a certain. It's like what they want is is the the the, the whole question of the the whole uh, uh, we want the authentic sauce, and mm. like, like, like we, we want we want. Uh, what's what's most interesting about you is this thing that we can we can we think we see that's different about you and and so um, um, that's what I that's what I, I, I know we're jumping ahead in the in the, in the sequence about what sort of uh, we're, we're up against but that, that sort of um, uh, I feel is trying to establish a space against um, these other factors as well. Mm -hmm. When I wrote Native Gardens, the first mm. version, it had a really gut punch mm. ending. Like, the guy had a heart attack, and then the other couple kind of won but lost their soul, and, you know, <laughs> it was that kind of thing. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, you know, they sold a house, and the neighborhood was never the same. And I remember, oh, yeah, this is edgy, this is good, this is what they'll do in New York. Um, <laughs> And then I looked at it again, and I, and I was like, what would it take for it to be a happy ending? Mm -hmm. And I very, very consciously was like, it's not so hard to have a happy ending. And I'll tell you, that ending is controversial. Like, some people love it, and some people hate it, because they like, it's too, you know. But really, it was just people decided to forgive each other and, and, and compromise. It's really that easy. That was the, that's <laughs> what the people end, at the end did. But I struggled with that, because I felt... I knew the moment I did the happy ending that the audience that that I that that certain things certain theaters would not touch the play anymore because I didn't punish people I didn't punish the audience <laughs> for loving <laughs> characters. Um, and, uh, these yeah. places are in trouble. <laughs> right, no, but it, it felt like and, and or punish myself, you know, I mean that kind of thing. And it, it was really a struggle to kind of just go, well why because I just wanted people to be, I, I wanted joy. I think that, that kind of idea, how can you talk about really hard things and leave hopeful? Because so many of these plays, I don't leave hopeful afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of comedies actually have an undercurrent of hopelessness mm -hmm. in them. And I, I don't need, personally, mm -hmm. I don't need that in my life. There's already enough hopelessness going, and so mm -hmm. why do I go to the theater to, you know, it, I think it needs to heal you in some way. It doesn't mean it doesn't poke things and make you realize where it hurts so that you can take care of it. But anyway, it, it was very interesting to me that I struggled with putting, a, and, and I was like, well, isn't that what a comedy, comedy is a happy, you know, mm -hmm. people get married at the end or mm -hmm. they find each other and tragedy is people die and mm -hmm. have a heart attack and move away. Um, so anyway, it, what is comedy and this idea of, of comedic plays that then, do the gut punch, which I love. Actually, I wasn't able to deliver on that. I think you're. I think you're right, though. That there's. So I agree with. I agree with everything you're saying, and I also think that there's. That joy at the end, or the hope at the end of of a comedy, even a comedy that is political, you know, whatever that means to whomever's reading it, politically engaged or dealing with a social issue or whatever. Like the act of hope at the end, I think, is wildly radical, and like incredibly welcome. Um, and I'm always, personally, I'm always most interested in comedies that can marry that with the, um, 
truth with sort of that examination of something right. that's happening. Truth telling and hope yeah. at the same time. Like I think about um, uh, like Queeg Wynn's uh, She Kills Monsters, right? Like, yeah. That play is about a whole bunch of stuff. You could like dig into the stuff of that and have like post show conversations and like you know thematic nights, whatever. But the it is like wildly silly and like totally hopeful at the end. And for that reason, that was like a really great programming choice for us because uh, though we do do things that have gut punches in them, we also we often don't feel like we can send our audiences out into the world feeling like they've just been like destroyed, right? Even if it's you know for an important reason. You know, Jamie, your question about who um, who is doing co the comedies. I mean, on the one hand, there's the theaters that we want to program comedies. And I feel like the other step is the directors who want to do uh, comedies mm -hmm. yep. and the, the directors who execute comedy mm -hmm. well, right? It, it's a particular area of expertise. Mm -hmm. And when I ask people, I, you know, I'll say, like, who are the directors who, who are, are good with comedies? It's a short list, <laughs> you know? And, and we, you know, we keep coming back to Sean, but he's somebody who kind of set out to be good at comedy. and. And I feel like we're not even, we have a shortage of directors mm -hmm. who want to tackle that area of expertise. It's mm -hmm. like why Casey Nicola directs every musical comedy on Broadway these mm -hmm. days. Right. <laughs> and, and or Susan Stroh. Yeah. 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 But I also wonder if some directors are facing the same issues we're facing, mm -hmm. that you know they, they see there isn't a ton of comedy um, programmed yeah. programs. That, I right. mean, like, like Giovanna, who just directed Karen show did a beautiful job with the comedy. I've worked with her. I had no idea she was so gifted with comedy because I've mostly seen her do kind of darker, more lyrical right. stuff. So there mm -hmm. may also be, it's maybe a sort of like an interlocking mm -hmm. question. But you are also right that is a specific craft should be good at directing a comedy. I do feel like for me that my work is most done in smaller theaters. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's just, that's maybe that's the normal for everyone. <laughs> but like, it, always, it seems to hit a sweet spot in a 150 or less house, sometimes up to three. Like, and it's the rare exception that a play of mine will make it into one of the bigger, one of the bigger regional regional theaters. But it finds some of them at least have found this wonderful have have found this home in this other in this certain sort of size of theater. And that was what happened with with Boom certainly when it was when it had its its fun time of getting done a lot. Um, mm -hmm. All of those theaters, were, they were TCG theaters, but they were all on the, mm -hmm. on the much smaller, on the smaller house size end of the spectrum. And they seemed to be the ones that gravitated towards that work. The other, quite, the other thing I was thinking about just was, uh, do, as far as support of comedy, do commercial producers, are they more willing to go there than, mm -hmm. than nonprofit uh, mm -hmm. developers as far as? Because I mean, of like the populism. Because of the populism of it, or, or like you know, you, I was thinking like, what's that new world stage is right now? It's I mean, it's mm -hmm. Q, and, mm -hmm. but it's it's like a there's a um, a Hufflepuff show, mm -hmm. right? You were talking Puffs. about that, Puffs. Puffs. Um, <laughs> yes. and like a and like a daytime drinking show. I mean, I, you, know, you can argue the whether you want a show that's about daytime drinking at a at a regional theater, but like that all of the, <laughs> all of the shows are are seem to be generally funny, mm -hmm. um, including Jersey Boys. <laughs> Although, I, <laughs> <laughs> Although I feel like, and and this is getting super reductive because it's just yeah. so um, broad brush, but I feel like the comedies that I'm seeing getting programmed on Broadway tend to be more cynical than, mm -hmm. than, than I have the stomach for. Like, I can, um, um, I can leave a, a, an audience in a state of, like, not having satisfying closure but uh, but I do worry about cynicism mm -hmm. um, um, and when comedy is used to reinforce cynicism mm -hmm. like that that starts to feel very deadening to me mm -hmm. yeah and I'd, I'd also just add on to that too that just like I'm, I'm happy to have a super generalized conversation for the purposes of this meeting but like to talk about the monoliths of commercial producers or non-for-profit producers. There's actually some incredible commercial producers out there right now that are really doing crazy shit compared <laughs> to what was done 50 years ago mm -hmm. um, in terms of throwing money around to support uh, writers to just do their, like they're sort of doing their own commissioning in their mm -hmm. own way. Um, and then there's you know the bunch of people who really just like go to London once a year and try to figure out what's going to make money in New York, mm. um, and you know I do think but 
I do think it is valuable in another way to contradict myself. I contain <laughs> multitudes. <laughs> is um, <laughs> the the region the larger regionals like the the bigger the Lord A's and the Lord B's do function sort of in a a, a place of fear, um, a fear of collapse, a fear of losing the audience, a fear of being called out, a fear of not being cool, whatever it is. And so that that keeps comedies like I mean I mean we talked about Boom a little bit yesterday, which is like it keeps a show like that from being put in front of the five hundred seat house or the eight hundred seat house. Um, because it's too scary to mm -hmm. program that. Uh, uh, that actually the things that Peter made me realize that there's like a different technical challenge that is specifically in comedy in terms of house style. Because mm -hmm. you can't, yeah, like you, like dramas can kind of play anywhere because like if it's quiet, it's quiet. Mm -hmm. But like if you can't make the person in the really far back laugh and you lose like five rows, mm -hmm. they can kill the first the front people from ever laughing, and that's a really comedy specific thing. And the kind of like most stand ups would talk about the jokes they can tell in like a small house versus mm -hmm. the jokes they can tell in a big house and how you make the small house jokes work on a big house. Like Chris Rock does it by just like walking across the stage like goes, you know, just like he just paces in a visual way that just holds your attention. Like it's mm -hmm. just his rhythm that he created. And so like, I mean, some of it may be they're afraid of that audience, but there is like a weirdly technical challenge to like trying to make a thing that's funny play in a bigger space. Mm -hmm. and that, like, yeah, and just to add on to that too, I think at a lot of the larger, in a lot of the larger theaters, you're not playing to a full house. Mm -hmm. And that I think also mm -hmm. changes the temperature in the room. Like, mm -hmm. I think that you could probably take a, what might seem like a smaller comedy and try it in a larger house, depending on what your geography is in there and your architecture. But when you're playing to an 800 seat house that only has 300 people in it, it's, yeah. mm -hmm. it's hard. Yeah, and, and there's like, I mean, there's a kind of, there's just a kind of laugh you can't yeah. go for. Mm -hmm. Like, The Office is a hugely successful show, but the kind of laugh that that gets out mm -hmm. of people is a hard laugh to play in a thousand mm -hmm. seats, you know? <laughs> like, you, you need this broader fucking thing that, like, the Marx Brothers used to deliver or whatever. I mean, you were also really <laughs> critical, which gets back to my clown thing yesterday, where yeah. I think, like, when a lot of people are reading scripts, what they're reading mostly is the dialogue or maybe some interesting going stage directions, but they're not actually receiving like the entirety of a physical comedy. And this is something I've been thinking about about as my comedy is getting more and more physical. It's like how how does that, you know, how how do you how can you recreate a situation where someone can see part of it or learn to read it better? I don't I don't know what it is. That's a really yeah. difficult challenge. I, I love yeah. doing like a big physical set piece and everything. Yes. Right. I just like people throwing things, the tables <laughs> being upended or like yeah. I love farcy door people coming in and out of on stage, yeah. yeah and I, when you do that at a reading, it dies. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I'm like, I have a play, and, and we were talking, it's like, oh, well, this, it should start with this huge crest of energy. Mm -hmm. It's all like people, like a young couple, like trying to put their clothes on before the dad catches them fucking. <laughs> and you can't, and then, like in a reading, like you just know that the first 10 minutes are going to be like super slow, and then once it gets into like the relationship stuff, suddenly people will pay attention. And at the same time, it's the reverse. And so, like a theater would read that play, and like a small, a, a, a large theater, where it would sell like the audience, like they would, it would capture their attention. Might be like, well, this doesn't play in a reading, so I don't trust it, and they have to really trust it to do it. And then a small theater might be like, well, I don't have the infrastructure to make some of these like crazy, wacky, physical yeah. things happen, so then I can't afford to do it. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, this is where does this go then? You know, and it's like that's like comedy does run into these 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 traps that like, you know, drama doesn't have to really think about, or if you can do a comedy that's like dressed as a drama, you know, then you, do, you also kind of avoid, avoid these things. I think that that point about the development process as being sort of like, it neutralizes everything. It sort of brings everything to a, like a center point of like, this is what can be accomplished in a reading. This is what, this is the kind of thing we will respond to. So this is the kind of thing we'll program, right? I think that's a really astute observation. And I, for me, as a person who reads a lot of plays, there's nothing I love more than a really um, sort of uh, meaty author's note and a set of instructions about how to, like, how the author wants me to engage the text. Right? If you tell me up front, in as I'm reading a play, not like in a development reading, but to myself, uh, like this is a physical comedy, and so 
like all the people in this play are going to have their own physical score, and it's going to have this kind of crescendo. And I'm going to indicate in the script by pointing at this. Like that helps me as a reader, kind of like just like retune myself. So I think in some ways, uh, I think comedy has a, uh, a bigger hurdle to jump in terms of getting script readers who may or may not have a lot of education in script mm. reading, how to give them all the information they need in order to read it in the best way possible. Yeah, um, so, so we've transitioned very seamlessly. Sorry. <laughs> into, no, this is great, into some of the obstacles and challenges, right? So what are the, the comedy specific challenges that you all have run up against? Um, what are you know the barriers to getting more comedies produced, supported? Um, obviously, we've touched a little bit on you know fear. <laughs> touched a little bit on um, some of the unique challenges facing development. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about how size and maybe that there's a sort of at least in this moment an innate sense that comedy can only play in a certain kind of house. Mm -hmm. um, what other challenges? I think it's also like what's allowed to be funny. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, I've talked a lot about villain. Show. Sean and I just did, but we had this great first production, and now we're looking for a second production. And it's a very, very physical play that's largely about motherhood and being a woman. And I keep, you know, a lot of people have said they're going to read it, and I trust that they will. But some of the people have said, it's, you know, it's just, it's silly. Like, it's this, it's, I don't know, it's just relevant. Like, the sort of, and like the number of women who came up to me after the show of all different ages saying, like, I've never felt seen, I've never seen that joyful play about being a mother. Like, Think about moms are usually so sad. <laughs> like, I'm just like this is relevant. If you know half the house is feeling seen by it, and so it's something that I've been grappling with about how to, you know, assert the relevance of it. I guess. I was thinking so much about what Julie said about the number of unfunny people we've all worked for, <laughs> 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 and, and like that's just so true. If you think right. about like. Ultimately, like you can have a great author's note and you can have a great reading and all those things, but you know, the people that pull the, the trigger on what gets put in, if they're not funny people, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's just right. There's also a thing where like there's actors, right? There's like certain actors that are funny and there's certain actors that are not funny, and regardless of how good a director you are, they're gonna stay in those two camps, right? <laughs> and I think it's, I wonder that about artistic directors, like. Are they only swayed by numbers or reviews somewhere else because they don't intuitively understand what would play well for their audience? Yeah, and, and also then they, uh, there's also a, a sense of trying to replicate and whether it be the box checking of like mm -hmm. making sure you have the Asian play, the black play, the funny play, the girl play, whatever, um, there's, there's that. And, and to a certain extent the box checking I think is, is valuable to a certain extent in that it keeps people accountable it's when it becomes just limited to the box checking that I think we all chafe against that. But like that was the thing w when we did these Marx Brothers plays, it's like all of a sudden then you're looking for what is the next Marx Brothers play? <laughs> and like, there's only a couple of them and they're dead. And um, <laughs> it's like, like you can't just keep replicating the formula, but of course there's a desire, you found the thing that worked, mm -hmm. so shouldn't you, you know, repeat the experiment? And then there's theater funny, which is different than yeah. real funny, yeah. right? <laughs> Vanya, Sonia, Masha, and clothes, or whatever it is. Um, right, where it's just like there's like a general sense that it's amusing, and someone else found it amusing, and so yeah. that, it's like that the joke, it's the joke territory thing. That's yeah. right, right. It, it, yeah. Greg Kotis always says it smells like funny. <laughs> you know, and you're like, oh yeah, I think this smells like funny, as opposed to like you actually laughed out loud. <laughs> no, I remember I had a reading of. Um, at Steppenwolf, and it, it's a comedy that still hasn't been produced. And it was a great reading, like using some of their company members. People were laughing so hard, they were crying. It was like this great kind of experience of a comedy that was working, and it didn't get done, you know? And I'm like, I don't know, yeah. I don't know what to tell you. Like, the evidence is there, you know? And I'm sure, I'm sure we all have stories like that. I feel there's an apologetic nature when the theaters do sketch, it's like, oh, you know, this is our light. This is our mm. our, our light play, um, and that's not true everywhere. I think some certain theaters are turning that around a little bit. But sometimes I even feel slightly apologetic about mm. myself. Like this yeah, is, yeah. I, the, I I feel like I need to also be like, this is my fucking comedy, and I love it. <laughs> but there's a little part of me is like, oh, you know, am I doing this because I can't write the mm. the, the big stuff? The big stuff, right? Um, and so I, I also have to, my role is also to walk in loud and proud 
and not, you know, uh, you know, you're always scared. This is not what I always feel like artists do. They go, oh, this is not my best, or, or you know, <laughs> or, or, or you're really worried someone's judging you, and so you're like, oh, I, I know it's not everything it could be, but you know that. And I, I want, I hear myself sometimes say that, and I'm just like. I wouldn't talk that way about my children. I would say, <laughs> I would say my son is not, you know, what I expected. But, you know, but, you know, yeah, 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 exactly. It's like, oh, for, for a son. So, sometimes I, I, I have internalized this kind of, this kind of looking down at it, and I need to, my role as a, comedic act, you know, writer, but I have something I could change is no longer be slightly uh, apologetic mm -hmm. or minim minimize, because minimize, it's really hard to write a funny play. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to, you know, to get a lot of things across. And, and, you know, everyone cries about the same things, but nobody laughs at the same things. Mm -hmm. So I, I have, I am really happy about this convening because I want to own, I want to own this, this, this more and not feel like even myself, you know, with the sitcom thing and all those things they say, it's like, yeah, well, it's the, you know, it's, anyway, <laughs> to have pride, full pride in the work without a but mm -hmm. afterwards. You know, we were talking, I did this um, conference in May at Hedgebrook about women in theater, and they were talking about the word mastery and how that's not often applied to female playwrights, and I'm sure that extends to more than female playwrights, that to be a master is to be a white male playwright, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so I will have people say to me, um, you know, were you surprised at how funny it was? <laughs> and I'm like, I knew exactly <laughs> where every <laughs> laugh was. You know, I could have scored it for you yeah, and told yeah. you where the laughs were. There's also this thing in comedy, we, we, we just talked about like, different types of comedy we all feel aren't being done in a weird way. Mm -hmm. Like, like they're, not doing, they're not doing comedy that touches on hot button issues. They're not doing comedy that tries to avoid being political. It's like, those are like the opposite things. <laughs> yeah. So are they, what's happening? But in a way, I think the ones that are done the most are the plays. I would also say like in theater, like there's just, there's like, um, I'll put it in quotes, but there's like funny. It I don't necessarily know if the play is like listed as a comedy or the writer would call it a comedy, but they're, they're funny and they get a funny slot. And so, it's the plays that can kind of be protean, that like mm -hmm. you can you you know you can sell them as like this is about this big issue. It's about you know, and then you can also be like it's just about family. And if you can <laughs> write a play that sort of can be sold all those different ways, then that's the plays that get done the most because it gives every person, the, every artistic director, the ability to look into that play and see what they want, and every and their marketing people to see what they want in terms of. So I think those are the ones that are done the most. It's just really hard to figure out how to, to do that. You know, how to write everything and nothing at yeah, the same time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, like, oh, I'm, I'm being a little too dangerous here, so let's shave that off a little bit. But it's not dangerous enough here, so I'm like, but I put a little thing yeah. in there. You know, like, it's just this weird, mishmashy effort that feels like what really the skill that you have to build is how to talk about, I mean, I don't want to call it straight up bullshit, but basically how to write a grant proposal for your work, <laughs> where you can say, yeah. it's like writing a college essay. You just need to say whatever the nonsense you, you think these people, yeah, to get in. And like knowing how to write the college essay, knowing what this audience really wants out of you, and knowing that that audience will shift is, is the skill. And, that's, and then that helps you get done, and that has almost nothing to do with the play. And that's, a, that's actually the power of the, the good review. Like if you can get the first production someplace, and then you have that good review, then that artistic director can then say, it has been tested, it has mm -hmm. been proven. Which, you know, on the flip side, it's also where the bad review means that the, the play will have a very hard time finding another life, right? Um, and that part of, like, this is where, like, I, I can tell you how many dramaturgs are fighting for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it is true, the, um, and not to say the, the bullshit college essay, like the child of parents who ran a college <laughs> counseling <laughs> service. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But like the, those opening remarks that you put in your plays, how you write your stage directions, what blurbs you give us, or that you have your agents give us. Um, if you know that we are reading your plays, you know, give us give us those five talking points to bring in to make the elevator pitch for you because it is it, it is that hard and that brutal and that easy. Talking about like so. It, Thinking about it yesterday too, it was like I, I was like, 
is there an alternative to script mm -hmm. submission huh. for programming? Yeah. That like, if, maybe this is for later, but like, <laughs> um, I was like, if instead I were, like a theater was wanted to work with an actor, like a really great comic actor, and that's actually the, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's I, I'm sure some theaters do that, and that's how it gets programmed. It's mm -hmm. like, we want to do something, and then and it's sort of finding those partnerships mm -hmm. with artistic collaborators before you even get to the theater um, is another, uh, like how do you, is that another alternative way to, to sort of showcase what a comedy could be because you've already kind of thinking about the performative aspect of it before it even gets to mm -hmm. the, the decision making place. No, I think absolutely. I think the, uh, you know, it's funny, uh, actors theater was really um, more of a playwright's theater. <laughs> right? yeah. Poorly named. <laughs> <laughs> but it was always interesting to me because like yeah. the, the decisions, especially around the Humana Festival, were very, very playwright driven, right? Like we found these plays and then the playwright chose the director and then, then you moved on from there. OSF has this tremendously large acting company. It's like about 100 something people right now this year. I think year, next year it's gonna be fewer. But um, a, a repertory acting company, some of whom have been there for 20 or 30 years and are insanely beloved by our audiences, often rightfully. Um, and, um, but it's really a director's theater, right? It's like Bill, uh, I don't know what it'll be like with a new artistic director, but Bill in particular, he starts with directors. He goes to his peers and he says, what are the plays? And so as much as Amritha or me or Louis or whoever else is reading is bringing to the table, he is getting from his colleagues. And then if you then double down that with to say like, oh my God, I have like such a great part for David Kelly or like I know that you really wanted this actress to come back, you know, after being in New York for a couple of years and I have the right play that's gonna make her come back to Oregon. Like these, like this is part of, these are those five points that you should give us. <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. and I think most good dramaturgs um, will want to, especially if you know us, like don't just like randomly <laughs> say, hey dramaturg at Southern Arkansas Route. Um, but like, but what are, who are the people that you know? Like this is where, it is it, is it nepotism? Is it what gets you over the transom, like from the transom to the desk, to the, to the meeting, right? But, um, but those five points, like know, know who you are talking to and the dramaturgs can really help you with that. I do think there's something about like comedy, the taste is not shared in right. terms of comedy. And yeah. I think that's something that, that um, you guys talked about in that why comedy section yesterday. And I do think that that contributes to like, um, theaters are not a democracy, but taking a chance often happens in those more sort of like more democratic moments mm -hmm. where like everybody on staff rallies behind a play yeah. and just demands that the artistic <laughs> director do it. And I do think that is a little harder for comedy because like even amongst our artistic staff, we don't share taste about what's funny. Sure, but you know, like I, and this is, doesn't need to just be a conversation between me and Charles, but, um, <laughs> but, the, but that's where like, I will rally against Othello until the day I die. Like that is just a play that I do not think, like fine, you wanna study it in school, that is not a play I need to personally sit through anymore. And so like, that's where like, the, getting into the, the scrum, like this is what I hope other artistic departments are doing, especially at the larger places. Like I hope that they are getting into the scrum of this, right? That like, I, as a dramaturg, my job is to read the play and I think I'm pretty good at it and say like, this is not my cup of tea, but I can tell you why it's good, mm -hmm. right? And it is, that is my training, that is my job, that is my purpose in your artistic department, but I will also expect you artistic director, producers, whoever else is in that decision making circle to be there with me to also see the, the value of something even if it's not something you like. Mm -hmm. I can't stand mushrooms. <laughs> I just do not like them. I have tried over and over and over again. But like, I will buy them if someone's coming to my house and they like mushrooms, right? It's, like, it's not that hard. You know? <laughs> 
up um, Peter your idea of packaging I, you know it's something I struggle with because mm -hmm. if I, I attach a play to a certain director mm -hmm. and we sort of take it out together sometimes it helps you and sometimes it hurts right. you sometimes the artistic director wants to direct it sometimes it's the women's project and you're working with the male director you know like I never know whether that's helping or hurting in mm -hmm. a sense I've been thinking a lot about the Kilroy's that we've been talking. Mm -hmm. I felt like they did such an amazing job of sort of making it easy for people to find these hard to find plays. And uh, I know people. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, and I don't know if there's some like we could build like a little funny network, funny empire, <laughs> and not just plays, but if we could, I don't know what it is. I don't know how it would work, but like the people, the like, funny directors and funny dramas. I don't know if there's some way mm -hmm. to kind of like. Make it easy for people to understand that there's like a whole comedy universe that could come through this play. Yeah, yeah. and I was sort of, I've been thinking. I was also thinking yeah. about the Kilroy's as we were yeah. talking, and I was sort of thinking about NPX and how oh, things get thing. tagged there, yeah. and how powerful um, reader uh, reviews are, like reader reports on on the new play mm -hmm. exchange page for a play. That if I'm reading, if I'm reading through like a bunch of like you know, options for let's say I check, check for comedies of a certain size or whatever, and I'm reading the reports. And like people who who write about like feeling moved to laughter, that's a different kind of like endorse. Even if I don't know who that reader is, right? Like that sometimes that helps me get my get the frame right around. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about like like how to how to exactly what you're saying, how to pull together things that uh, whether it's a network or whether it's a some kind of like and comedy NPX, <laughs> right? Like comedy it. NPX, right? Yeah. Um, and sort of like making like what are the tools out there already that can be leveraged, mm -hmm. and what are tools that are waiting to be built? Well, and what the it was so powerful about watching the Kilroy spin into existence, and I have been on like the mm -hmm. almost list a couple times, <laughs> like is to feel like part of something to be like, oh, mm -hmm. like be like these plays are now being seen. Mm -hmm. I was also going to say earlier, I was thinking about what you were saying about the readings process and, and some of the other conversations, and we more than once have programmed something that we were. Uh, a little on the fence about, but then we saw a, even a partial video of just a really well done reading, like a reading that the playwright was like really happy with, or that had been cured, like even 10 minutes of a longer piece. Um, something that, that gives the tempo and the flavor, the aesthetic, the, I don't know, whatever that, that atmosphere is. Sometimes just even a short scene out of a play on video with non-equity actors who so don't have to worry about the video. Um, that can go a long way towards getting a group of people who have different levels of reading skill um, on the same page about what the potential of that piece might be. And that's a, that's a great idea, but I do want to make an aside, which is a complaint about the photographs of comedies. And the marketing tropes where comedy <laughs> blurbs involve yeah. exclamation points, mm -hmm. I protest. <laughs> <laughs> show there, the, they were doing Betrayal, the, uh, the Pinter play, <laughs> it was being marketed as a romantic comedy. <laughs> 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 so maybe I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> um, the theaters, that was, a, that was my first year in Louisville. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. maybe, um, no, I've had this dream for a while, and I'm going to share the dream, because maybe if I say it out loud in a group of people with a camera on, it'll come <laughs> into reality. But um, uh, one of the things I've been very inspired by with American Revolutions, and I'm incredibly proud of this program that I've worked on, is that it did create this cohort, mm -hmm. at least among the writers, right? It was like, that was sort of built into, into it. And it, it's, it's continuing without me. So it's like, they're not dead, I'm just not there. Um, but, um, but I'm sort of trying to figure out, like, knowing what I know about how uh, theaters operate both on the social level and on the economic level and on the political level. Um, and they all just repeat to a certain extent, um, the larger ones. Um, but of just like, what are the things that we could do to make a commissioning program that would actually serve comedy well? Mm -hmm. And so um, if anyone has, I've estimated it out, it would take about $4 million. So if anybody has $4 million, I will gladly take it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And sort of figuring out like what does that mean? Like what are what are your home theaters that you would want to mm -hmm. do it with? Like what is what would a guarantee of production look like for a comedy that might that you wouldn't necessarily give every other commission? Mm -hmm. What would it take to get a theater to jump in on that? What are the the development processes that most theaters have in place? Like are so well intentioned, 
but um, because of scheduling, because of money, because of everything, they have to exist in a certain form that doesn't serve every play, much less every comedy, every musical, every drama, every tragedy, every whatever. And so like, what are the things that we could put in place with the proper support that would enable a theater to think outside of their own box? So this, this is like, this is the Julie dream. Mm -hmm. um, so $4 million. Well, I, I mentioned this yesterday, but the writer's room model that Ed Sobel did at the Arden, mm -hmm. where you did have a guaranteed two-week workshop production of the commission. And writing a commission, knowing it's going to open on a certain date, is a completely different experience. Yes. And it was so effective, I mm -hmm. have to say. Mm -hmm. And I think that question, too, I mean, and I, Ed, Ed as, a, as a, someone I've known for a long time, too, and a lot of that question of, like, where do you invite strangers into the room with you? It's like, mm. there, I love being a rehearsal dramaturg. It's one of my favorite things about my job. But after seeing the same scene 9,000 <laughs> times, I might not be your best laugh, even though like on the first time, I am your best laugh. <laughs> you want me in your room. I'm an easy, I'm go. But, uh, but by the sixth or seventh time where you're gonna do it, I'm gonna be like, okay, it was funny the third time? I don't know. Um, <laughs> and so when do you bring that fresh set of eyes into it that are not necessarily people who are, you know, like, when do you bring in the non the non theater workers into the room? And who are and they? And who and yeah. like all of these questions, like how individualized could you make each process? Mm -hmm. Because even American Revolution, like it's been such a delight to be able to serve the writers and give them like people ask for a thing, and I've been able to say here, um, you know, whether it be a, a research trip or a workshop or three weeks to you know just sit in an apartment at OSF and stare at the mountain while writing a play. Like, what are the things that you can do to keep it individualized, but also knowing that there has to be a system in order for something to work? Like, how do you, like, where are the subversions? So, um, but yeah, um, I think, and having that base outside of a theater, I think would probably also be good, knowing what I know about how the regionals uh, both collaborate and compete with each other. So we've magically transitioned again, mm -hmm. perfectly, so four into, million dollars into, for <laughs> into the, last, um, <laughs> the last piece of this conversation, which is, you know, what's worked? Like, dreamy development, like what has worked well in your experience? What have you not gotten to experience that you think would help in the development <laughs> of comedies? Mm -hmm. We've obviously touched on some things already, but had a lot of really big physical sequences in them and like a lot of them were fights but mm -hmm. were also funny and that's like two things happening they're choreographic and um and we had great workshops with the script but i think there is some part of me that was like oh we also need to workshop like either the mm -hmm. fights or the funny or the both because then like really the first two weeks of rehearsal ended up just being building that stuff mm -hmm. and i did that like crazy rewrite the day before tax that you never really want to the, you know so i think for me something i would love to find a way to do is to like the same kind of workshops we give to the text to still have the, not have necessarily be director driven, but have like playwright and director working together to. Yeah, yeah. I think that's huge. I think it's really yeah. important. And, and for playwrights to be able to ask for that. Yeah. I think oftentimes theaters are trying to figure out what is the best model. Yeah. And so I find I often will ask a playwright, like well, what, kind of, what kind of development work do you need? And sometimes the folks we're asking don't, they don't necessarily know how to answer that question to what they want for that moment, right? right? But I, I think if somebody said, that, like we work with Natsu, right. owner to power, right? And we did right. like many physical workshops mm -hmm. before we got into rehearsal for exactly that reason. Mm -hmm. So I think, I always love when players are able to tell me, yeah. like that's what I want and then we can build that. That's great. I think with Dusty and Desire, when we did it at Arena, we, uh, it was me and uh, the dramaturg there, Jocelyn, and we didn't do a table read. We got up on our feet immediately. Mm -hmm. And we built the play. We didn't write, so we were building the play. And we're like, oh, we don't need that. You know, we actually had the actors, it's kind of improv -y. I mean, there was text, but the idea of how it looked in three dimensions with the physicality, we did three days. And that was incredibly um, helpful, especially for that. But it, so I, I, I echo that in the, the idea that comedy, it, it, you build on things. Mm -hmm. And then like an actor finds something that yeah, they're not you're right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you kind totally. of start to incorporate that. 
It can't just be sitting right. around a table. <laughs> Is there's a technical aspect to comedy and the logistics of the entrance exits, the time of a change and all of that does become important that you but have also, to test. Right, and also early in the script when you're still, I remember I had an extra priest and I was like, I don't need the priest, I just need the nun. <laughs> 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 I have enough of the priest, right? But you, you, could, you couldn't tell that until we were like walking around and this actor had nothing to do. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, so it was, it was interesting in that way. Very early, very early first draft. Workshop of Netflix at UMass Amherst, where um, in two weeks I had four presentations of it, like two in the front and two in the back end, and the amount of work I was able to integrate. Um, I was pleasantly surprised at how engaged, the, the particularly engaged, the collegiate audience is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as institutions, number one, it's not quite a captive audience, but you know, it's, 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 it's a lower barrier of entry. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but, but you also had like like parents would show up too and, and, and professors and, <laughs> and, and so so you, you had like a, a very you know like a very 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 um, um, discerning audience as well mm -hmm. and, and tuned in in a way that I was really helped it and, and, and I think that that um, maybe um, professional theaters could consider teaming up with more um, uh, more, more um, colleges and universities as incubators uh, because they have resources and, and these kids are just dying for entertainment. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's uh, like especially with more remote colleges. Uh, um, I went to school in Ithaca, so it's like, give me something to like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it, it's not like, it's not like they don't have the money. So um, yeah, I think, I think, I think that, that um, for me personally, that was like one of the most rewarding processes I've gone through. And um, I would encourage more of that. Do you know someone who knows your voice? I cannot tell you, how, especially in comedy, because I've had people say, I didn't know this line was funny. <laughs> and Blake Robeson's like, oh, I knew it was funny. You know, like, you know, Sean knows it. There's people who know that. So you just do find the ones who do, especially when you're, and then once your play is done, mm -hmm. you can let other people. But in, in, when it's in a baby thing, you need someone who knows your voice. Now that we talked about the fundraising side, A lot of experience as a grant writer, which is why I have a job right now. <laughs> Fortunately, unfortunately, I don't know. Um, but I think there's a lot of these um, major institutions who are supporting commissions and development of new work, and it is mostly, you know, social justice theater, which I think is is so important. Um, I guess I'm, I'm I'm lifting that up as as that is a a wonderful thing about foundations right now and also a potential barrier if you're not writing that kind of work. Um, but Edgerton and Mellon and Tolman and these biggies. And I do find that as a grant writer, I'm often surprised by what playwrights will bring to the table or will not bring to the table in terms of grant writing. And I also, yeah, I just, I, uh, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm surprised that's not more of a part of the playwriting vocabulary. And I've met some playwrights with like an amazing amount of grant writing hustle where they'll like approach me and be like, oh, I hear like this commission is opening up in two months and I just want to let you know that I'm working on this thing. Um, and then other people who like won't respond to my emails when I say like, okay, it's due tomorrow and it's a hundred million dollars. Um, so that would be like, a, that would be a great workshop for playwrights, you know? Sort of how do you speak the language of the funders? You know? Totally, yeah. Yeah. I agree with yeah. you so much. I was always sad they didn't offer a grant writing in my grad program. Mm -hmm. it was, it sure. is, you end up writing so many applications. Are, are you I just talking about the hustle of playwrights or the way that they connect with you? or? I think also the way they talk about their work. Or it's like, okay, we want to approach you about a commission. Uh, you know, what do you have, what are you working on right now that could be a possible commission? And even the way playwrights talk about those things or their understanding of what might be fundable or what might not be fundable. And part of that is just the, you know, getting to know a playwright and depending on that, that relationship with the theater, your relationship with their work and all of that, it's complicated. Um, but I think I'm, I'm sometimes surprised that playwrights don't, uh, don't have a better sense of the, just like the pulse of what's getting funded and what's not getting funded. Um, I was sort of curious, I don't know if you talked about this yesterday, um, but I wonder if anybody has looked at uh, the trends of NNPN. We're, we're newly core members and so I'm not, I haven't been like up to my eyeballs in it enough to know like his really pay attention to historically what gets rolled and what doesn't, um, sort of numbers wise. But I'm what it feels to me. I could be so wrong. It feels to me like it's more amenable to comedies, yep. right? Like that's right, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about like 
for, this is really connected to what you were saying, for companies who are in an NPN, and I think it's a little different if you're a core versus if you're an associate, there are these, um, there are these like uh, opportunities for commissions that come up. So we just participated in putting forward a play to compete amongst a couple other plays uh, for a commission from an NPN. And of all of the member theaters across the whole network, only nine theaters put forth uh, plays to be considered. And so like our odds are like real good and it's a comedy that we're putting forward. But I think too about like, if a, if a player has a relationship with a company and you know that that company is part of different kinds of networks, whether it's an NPN or something else, or there's an American Revolutions tag to it. Like I don't know what those things are, all of them, but that was a moment where we put it forward because the playwright came to us and was like, "We really, I really want to put my put my play forward for this thing." And so we did. And now I realize he only has to compete against eight other people, as opposed to, you know, a million. So I had a really positive an NPN commission, and it actually like touches on like development away from the theater. Yeah. Um, Mellon Foundation. It was a. It was a, through New Dramatists. They had a um, full stage program, which was um, basically New Dramatists partnered um, with various groups of theaters. One of which was NNPN. Um, there was a commission fee. The New Dramatists handled all of the development. The playwright designed their development process until, um, and then I, and then it moved over to a lead mm -hmm. NNPN theater. Mm -hmm. um, so I was again like outsourcing a little bit of that early development, mm -hmm. allowing that me to customize how to get there mm -hmm. and being supported by that am amazing place, um, and then and then and then also very generously funded by a by a foundation. It's hard too, right? Because yeah. I feel like some of those some of those options are are more open to comedies than others, right? Yeah. Like Map Fund, I. Yeah. They don't really, yeah. <laughs> not known for their yeah. comedic uh, projects. But like maybe the DGF, which is coming up, I think on November 2nd, right? Like there's a bunch, but I think NP and NPN and those other kinds of yeah. joint projects sometimes feel more open to that. Yeah. And that's the part that I, I yeah. you know, going to your point about not being taught grant writing in grad school. Um, I mean, and you know, maybe the, the residencies themselves have, have, have sought to answer some of this, but the actual, like, Way that the machinery works mm -hmm. at the at the play factory is not is is opaque, and of course they're all different, right? Yeah. But they're but that sense of like when I am talking to somebody about how the season works at OSF, like it would be impossible for somebody to know any of that from the outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so whether that be a grant opportunity, whether that be why your design deadlines are so early, mm -hmm. whether that be like all of those things of like the the, the parts of it that are kept from the artists who come to work at the institution and then the sense of entitlement that the institution can put onto the artists yeah. is, a, is, a, is, a, is a true thing. So I want to go back to Dreamland a little bit here. Like, yeah. so we, we've looked at Stop up being some so real, dude. <laughs> <laughs> some, we've looked at some bright spots or some positive experiences that people have had, but like, what haven't you had that you would like to have? I mean, mm -hmm. Lila Rose, you, you called out, yeah, having a sort of physical workshop, right? Being able to have a separate thing from script development. What are other ways that you think your comedy could be supported um, in development that you, know, you haven't experienced that you think would be helpful? This, this isn't constructed, but <laughs> honestly, what we want most of all is productions. We want productions. Mm -hmm. Comedies are tested in front of an audience, you know? Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line. I would like actors to get more training in comedy mm -hmm. uh, because the idea of learning where to take a beat or look or all of that, it is so, it's like a high wire. And I, I think theater programs, et cetera, should all have, you know, and not just the Shakespeare comedies, but, but really go, uh, actors just don't always get to exercise that muscle and they feel self-conscious mm -hmm. about it. Um, at least that, that's been my, my, just as we feel, you know, they're like, I'm an actor and now I'm doing, you know, it, it's, I, I find that I would like for more actors to embrace the comedy of it and the, the, the hard training that comes with it. It's a very hard art form, especially if you're an actor. You know what I've discovered, which was interesting, I'm not a musical theater person, but I've discovered that musical theater actors are mm -hmm. really good for comedy mm -hmm. 
because that sense of timing, the sense of rhythm that comes with knowing music. You yeah, know. the sense of performing. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't want to throw a whole class of actor under the bus. I have the complete opposite. Hmm. Really? Because I find that musical theater actors frequently over-indicate. Mm. And if you That's want... A good one. I mean, I guess it's like... Say it's Nathan, so we'll say think Nathan Lane is a great one. And I think Nathan Lane can pull it in. Yeah. He's obviously done it, but it's just, it, pro it's, it doesn't, he doesn't know it. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, but you mean, so it's like, a, yeah, Nathan Lane, sorry, Nathan. I mean, Let's just you're going to do all right. I Nathan cannot Lane. possibly <laughs> 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 I mean, I think it's, what's hard is that, like, actors that really can cut the comedy, and, like, I mean, they can really do it. They they get plucked to television really quickly. Mm -hmm. They're hard. They're hard to keep. Mm -hmm. um, and like a lot of them don't even know to do to do theater. Like it's not even a thing. They're doing YouTube videos because that's how they want them to eventually make money. Or they're um, and it's just so I, there's something. There's also you know there's a, like talking to actors on how to like do that kind of comedy. Like I don't think theater has has done a great job of like I'm watching the show American Vandal and every performance is really really funny. Um, but none of it, it's all straight dry. They all basically come out of it. Like, the guys who direct it are like improv mm -hmm. people. Um, they know how to find the humor in a, human, in a very human, real character moment. And I don't know that I, I haven't been surrounded by that in the theater. Like, it, is, it does feel like in the way that, you know, you complain about the photos. Like, that is the moment. They're like, well, if they're not smiling enough, like, do people know it's funny? And, and that's... And that's a real, like, uh, actor training is a real struggle. I don't even know what kind of training you need. It's like, more and more people do improv training, so I think they're, they're getting it from, it's like, like, that. It's like a funny marriage of, like, Shakespeare and improv. Like, I've actually yeah. had good luck with Shakespearean actors, because they really have paid attention to the text and yeah. to the beats, mm -hmm. and so, I don't know, it's like a funny yeah. mix. I feel like something that would really help the field is how we can empower more actors to become directors mm -hmm. um, of like so many of the people who are so gifted with comedy as directors have that acting mm -hmm. experience on stage mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how do we um, take people who are mid-career actors that have the talent to be directors and support them into that role um, I think would be something that would be great for the field of comedy. I really feel like I Karen, I really appreciate you bringing up the training issue because I think that is so key and it's, I feel like we're talking about actors and directors and whatever, but I, I think it's like across the board, yeah. training in general across the board in comedy, which is often gets relegated to people being like, oh, I got cast in the comedy or like, oh, I guess I'm doing great. And that in, you know, whatever the, the play analysis chops are, the dramaturgical chops that are not directed at understanding comedy, how and why it works. Right, that from from go, whether you're an actor or a designer or whatever, it feels really key, really key. So we have a question from Facebook. I want to bring up. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> hey, Facebook, Nathan specifically Lane. from Mark Valdez. <laughs> hey, Mark. Hi, Mark. Um, so Mark asks. That's because I'm laying student. Mark asks. Uh, hey y'all, came to the conversation late, so forgive me if this has been covered already, which I don't think it has. Um, but wondering if theater. Which, which, which requires long form comedy, offers the right structure slash form for a contemporary comedy aesthetic more influenced by short form, hmm. such as cartoons, Funny or Die, Simpsons, et cetera. Can you get that one more? Yep. Seconds, seconds. <laughs> um, Mark is wondering if theater, which requires long form comedy, offers the right structure and form for a contemporary comedy aesthetic that is more influenced by short form. I would challenge the assumption that theater requires long form. Um, but, uh, and I think it's, you know, again, I know I'm supposed to be all dreamy, but <laughs> <laughs> that question of how, the other thing that the slots do for theaters is it, it then requires a certain kind of play to go into that slot. Mm -hmm. Um, and and I know I've said this before, but just like the idea of doing a slotless theater would be really exciting if people would um, figure out the economics of that. The economics of slot theater is not working, so I don't see any reason not to try something else personally. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you're on a simple level at a place like OSF, I think our average ticket price is something like $76. So to give somebody a 45 minute play for $76 is a different thing than giving them three and a half hours of Shakespearean tragedy mm -hmm. for $76, right? Um, I'm still gonna choose what I choose. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> that, but 
that so that that assumption, like yes, I would say that that is a, a fair assumption to make now. The question is, does that have to be a truth that we carry forward, just because it is a truth that we have always carried? Um, and so I would challenge that. I, I would just say, um, like that is that is absolutely something I recognize is, as an obstacle when I try to get comedy programmed. Is like one of the objections is I'm not sure it sustains to the second <laughs> act. Right. And like, uh, you 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 cannot convince someone that something is funny. Like, mm -hmm. you just you could talk for days, and sometimes it feels like those art staff meetings do go on that long. <laughs> and. Can, trying to convince someone that a play sustains into a second act without having a reading to show them or something, um, like it's just, it's so theoretical at that point. Yeah. And so like I, I, I do recognize something about that. Well, and I just wanna say just because it's a comedy doesn't mean it's not a play. And what determines the length of a play is the story, that it takes that long to believably unfold a particular story. So I, I understand that as a culture we have concentration span issues and stuff, but I, but I would hate to lose the sort of um, the growth that a full-length play allows the characters to undergo. Uh, yeah. I, I have two answers to that. I think the first is there there are, are shows I've seen like Booty Candy, which mm -hmm. is very much mm -hmm. it's not like a play play, but it's it's it consists mm -hmm. of many smaller mm -hmm. um, sequences that add up to a larger uh, discussion, which I I really liked as a theatrical experience. Um, and someone who comes from sketch and improv, I think that for the training aspect, there are there are certain tools you learn doing short form. It's not a one-to-one -one thing. I, I like it from going from like being a sprinter to a marathon runner. Um, like the pain feels similar in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, uh, but um, 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 it, 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 if you really study um, um, improv and how you, you, you can, you, you learn better, uh, you learn how to be funny without necessarily telling jokes. I think that translates very well to to um, longer pieces. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, I mean I, I hate to use a movie as a reference, but um, 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 uh, I was just talking about the, um, the, the death of Stalin, uh, which mm -hmm. which uses comedic beats not necessarily to comedic effect, but still uses comedic mm -hmm. timing mm -hmm. to it to tell a larger narrative that does talk about larger scopes of history and relationships. Um, I, I think that theaters definitely do have the space. Um, in dialogue with like improv theaters and improv training and sketch training, um, that that does um, move very well between different mediums. Um, one of the actors I've met through Sean is this wonderful um, actor out of Chicago named John Gregorio, and he's been in a couple of my shows there, and he's an incredible improver. And I actually wrote a section of the last play that allowed him to have some improv, which I'd never done, and it was so wonderful. And I was it was so great to see that like these two crafts could. You know, I've always, like, control freak me with always like, no, 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 <laughs> don't let anybody do anything, all that thing. But it was brilliant, and I think, like, the more we can work together, like, funny is funny, you know, like, work together to find how these forms inform each other, the more luck we're all going to have. There's also just, like, like the, that contemporary comedy aesthetic that is really actually based in video manipulation, like, a lot of it, and, like, memes, which are just a still image and fucking with it. But, like, there are, pe there are young people who are just, Sucking it into their brains right now, or just and they're, what they're and if any of them are like, oh, I also want to write theater, they're going to find a way to translate that aesthetic mm -hmm. into a, thea a more theatrical form. It's not going to be exactly the same thing as like the YouTube video or Eric Andre, but it's not exactly going to be the same thing as a play. It's going to be this new mm -hmm. thing, and that's going to be cool. The way Kui kind of did that, um, and that's like exciting. So you know, we have the potential to evolve things. If, if certain people get out of the way. <laughs> it, it's, it's capable. Like, they, they, I don't know if anyone, I mean, I'm sure someone saw Zendaya as Michi in this room. <laughs> but like that comedian is a clear musical theater nerd. Yeah. Like that is like the, the love of musical theater is that little memeable piece. And you know, th there are more of him coming along the way to find a way to translate these things together. I think it's also like who's gonna provide the opportunity, right? It's like yeah. that, this uh, 1491 show that we're doing next year between two knees, 1491s are a, a video sketch comedy group of, of guys. You know, I think the, their videos are probably like, you know, five minutes long at the top end. Um, and so when, uh, when we were introduced to them through Rihanna Yazi and New Native Theater and then American Revolution,
Revolutions commissioned them, at that point they had never written a play. They loved theater. They came to OSF a bunch and they saw a bunch of plays. They actually fell in love with, with Quigwin's work and, um, and Karen Zacharias's work um, in particular of just sort of like what are, like, because they wanted to ask that question like, okay, so this is what theater is and this is what we do, so how do we take what we do and make it theater? And this play that they're doing next year, is it still very much has this short form aesthetic. It's a, it's a tour through 100 years of history. Um, so it, it does sort of that jump cut. It does sort of have that, the aesthetic sensibility of it. But it, it's a complete play by any definition we learned at our fancy grad programs, right? <laughs> Culture clash. Did the same. Right, I was just going to bring clash, them up. Yeah. Right. Yeah, American Night 2, right out of the right. gate with it, American Revolution. So. Right, it was a full play. Mm -hmm. But it ha they built it. I mean, there's three brilliant mm -hmm. comedians that yeah. write and perform. I mean, there's that, that's the other part of, yeah. which is interesting in our role as playwrights, because I'm not a comedian myself, right? Like, I write, but the idea of actually people who are performing mm -hmm. it, creating it, is also a medium that's not, that, that yeah. needs to be part of this comedy conversation. I mean, I, in terms of dreamland, I would also dream for more programming conversations that are uh, more culturally competent, so that there are that there's more space for the wide variety of um, different cultural dramaturgies of comedy, right? That that the different comedies from different from people from different backgrounds from different histories have different shapes to them, and that the the scope of comedy is as broad as anything else. But if we don't, if the people who are making those decisions all look the same, sound the same, come from the same kinds of trainings and the trainings don't have that kind of depth and breadth, then we continue to replicate the same systems of programming that give us the same comedies over and over again. Could you give me an example of some of the different um, sure. comedy? I mean, I, yeah, I could, I mean, yes. So let's, different, different plays, different cultural tropes, right? So, uh, okay, so we've talked about Quee a couple times. So Quee's plays are comedies, and they're really different from like David Ireland's plays. Which, who, is, who writes about the troubles in Northern Ireland. He's a Northern Irish um, uh, Protestant writer whose plays are not in their, um, uh, <laughs> in their forcefulness, are not very different from Sarah Kane, for example, but have a kind of different quality to them. Um, and those, like, the, those, those different modes of comedy, if you're trying to program, trying to find your, your comedy slot, right? Like, and you have those two plays, plus let's say a culture clash play in front of you, plus, let's say, uh, um, the Thanksgiving play by Larissa Fasthorst, right? Like, there's, those all have wildly different kind of, like, comedic textures to them. They have different timings. They have different presumptions about who, what you know when you come to the table to meet those plays. And if you, if you don't have a sense as a reader, as a programmer, that they all can exist in their own uh, truths and authenticities, and you try and figure out like how to, how to um, sort of neutralize them in a way, how to, how to bring them all to the same level, whatever that might mean to you as a programmer, you miss out on a wide variety of stuff that is coming from a, a, just a hugely different background. I mean, so I, I mentioned earlier Natsu Onoto Power, who is a director writer, um, whose plays are like incredibly physical and, and are comedic and intersect with um, projection a lot of the time. Uh, and like a uh, uh, projection that is responsive in the moment to the actors. That is a whole different kind of comedy than uh, Neil Simon, right? So that's sort of what I mean is that I think that there are so many different kinds of very specific dramaturgies to comedy that painting it with all one brush, I think for a programmer, I think that happens a lot. And I think we've all, I think we, we see this in like every form of theater that comes sure. across our, our desks is that there's a, there's a, you know, every, each of, every single playwright, no matter who they are, is gonna bring a central perspective to their play, and whether it's visible to the eye, uh, the fox told us that's not always essential, right? <laughs> 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 like, but like that, um, that sense, uh, but all of our training and all of our, the, everything that we've watched, and certainly, you know, people on our committees who aren't asking bigger questions, that central perspective is expected to be Shakespeare or Aristotle or something along those lines. 
And so any step outside of that becomes a transgression. Mm -hmm. And so unless, so maybe now, I don't know, but, um, but just that, so I know for a lot of us, like we wind up in the, you have to meet this play where it is. Mm -hmm. And it, that, whether it be cultural competency or whether it just be like somebody has shifted a perspective. Totally is like a big question, especially, I find it so much with, with trying to talk about women's comedy. Yeah. Because there's just such this, like, it is- People a call it frivolous. It's, it's frivolous, it's right? just about a mom. It's, you know, it's just about some ladies, some teenage girls, you know, it's like, what does it matter? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it matters to the person who is giving me that perspective. Mm -hmm. And so shift your focus over to here, the same way I have been expected my whole life to shift my focus over there. I find that when right I'm writing again? children's plays, I'm sorry, <laughs> when I'm writing children's plays, that I always have some jokes for the parents, yeah, mm -hmm. and then jokes for the kids, and then people are like, oh, well, not everyone's gonna get in the same <laughs> with <laughs> you know, my more Latinx plays. I'm like, they're, they're like, well, not all of the audience is gonna get that reference, and I'm like, oh, I'm okay with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm I'm okay with that. Like that that is that is my Easter egg for mm -hmm. people who know where I come from yeah. and what I'm saying, and that's. There, there's also that work because I've had people like, oh, you, let's have the, can we translate the songs into English? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> right. And I like getting back to that thing about author's notes. Those are the kinds of things like if if I'm reading a play by a person I don't know at all. Like I know you, so I know that you're, yeah. I know how you per, uh, sort of approach your work. But if I'm reading something by somebody I don't know, I love getting that sort of like I don't need everybody to get this joke. Right. Or I don't like the world of this play exists in multiple spaces. Right. right? That's always helpful to me, and I love like I love that. Since so we're talking about dreams, this is not this is not going to happen. <laughs> that, uh, younger and cheaper. Yeah. That's that's the key thing for comedy. Sadly, like it's really hard to laugh after spending one hundred twenty dollars. Sure is. Like you're like, I spent one hundred twenty dollars on this. Like that's all I can think about. You know? <laughs> is it funny <laughs> enough? Yeah. Is it funny enough? I mean, like I did. I was very fortunate to be in, in the young in EST's Young Blood. Um, and like, there's so many writers out of that that are like super funny. And it was also just like when you're in it and you're doing these brunch plays, they have this series where they do a, you know, a Sunday and you have like a week or less. I, I did a rehearsal in one day once. Um, uh, where like they do these, they do a series of plays and like they select different writers each time. And there's so, there was like such a competitive thing to be the funniest one <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the, you know, and it's like, kind of, cause you kind of knew like everyone was drunk <laughs> they serve alcohol. I didn't want that. But like, there's a people, like a lot of the people there are like have some alcohol in them and they're more open and they're very willing to laugh and they're young. And, and then the writers are just like, let me see if I can top this person. And like, can I get the final slot? Because the final slot, you have to go with like the biggest bang, which means you have to create. And it was like awesome work. And I think a lot, all of us, like you know, a lot of the writers I can name, really took that training and then put it into long form in, in different ways. You know, like, um, you know, but like, I mean, it's really clear in like someone like Mike, Mike Lou or mm -hmm. Rob Askins. Um, but even I think, you know, I don't know how much Andy Baker would love writing brunch plays, but like there's yeah. like little jokes in there that yeah. like, it would, it, you know, that's an environment that would force you to hone those little jokes because you need, you need that. I remember Erica Sala, the very first show we did, she wrote this like, she came out of uh, Austin, no, no offense to the Michener School at Austin, but she, she wrote this like, Three person play where like everyone was one, two, three with the name of the characters. And she was just like, Oh, I really misjudged what this thing was. And then <laughs> after that, she just wrote these like really funny short plays that just like kind of slayed every time. But she just needed, you know, it was just a chance to work on the craft and it was a really great experience. So I mean that kind of incubator is great, but like I really do think that like, the fact that the audience was young and the fact that they didn't have to spend a lot of money meant that they were happy to laugh. Mm -hmm. And you had an audience. Right. Yeah, but we were yeah. packed. It was like fun. energy yeah. before standing. Because that might be dreamy too, is like development that somehow <laughs> has an odd, like a young, excited audience. <laughs> and development that gives you more than one opportunity to present it. Because yeah. you learn so much in between. Mm -hmm. and yeah. can't tell you. Um, well, that's a nice note to, to end on for this session. All the audiences, <laughs> all the youth. All the booze. Um, <laughs> um, thank you all for watching online, and we're gonna continue the conversation, but um, offline. <laughs>